Well, some people hope to hear more GPU news from NVIDIA at uh, GDC announcements. We really knew that that probably wasn't actually going to be the case, although we're still expecting RTX 4070's non-TI versions in April. That is still just rumors, though. However, T4C Fantasy, who is not just any random person tweeting on Twitter, this is the uh, maintainer of the Tech Power Up GPU database, um, is tweeting us some new specs on the 4060 Ti. It's giving us a base boost clock of 2310 versus 2535 with pre premium AIB cards up to 2685. But then with an edit coming in, 4060 or 4060 Ti, the gigabyte leak change uh, things, it has AD106. So clarifying it's AD106. Um, uh, again, Gigabyte had linked, uh, leaked some names for some of their upcoming cards and memory configurations I reported on my last video. Anyway, so this is interesting. It's not a massive update to what we knew previously. So uh, sure enough, videocards.com has already updated their, uh, their rumored specs chart. If you want to compare the 4060 Ti full rumored specs, uh, especially compared to cards that we know, like the 4070 Ti, we see the rumored specs of the 4070, and even what we know so far rumored specs on the 4060. And again, videocards.com is definitely thinking that, yeah, this, this would be the 4060 Ti, probably not the 4060. And they also threw together an interesting chart here uh, where you just uh, go off of their rough um, compute speed. So obviously there's more to a GPU than its teraflops of FP32 compute, but it is a way to rank them, especially within the same uh, same um, architecture, you know, like the, what they're doing here is setting the RTX 4090 as a baseline. And then if you go off the rumored specs for the CUDA cores and, and then the clock speeds and all that, then you can get a... Um, as, uh, get what the FP32 would be, again, if these rumors turn out to be true. These rumors would place the 4060 Ti at 27% of the performance uh, of the RTX 4090 in FP32 teraflops. And uh, again, you can look at where everything else stacks up against that. Even the 4080 is only 59% of the 4090. Uh, again, a much larger gap there than we saw with previous generations between the 80 and 90. Then you can see where the 4070 Ti comes in. And then here's the 4070 and 4060 Ti, the 4070 with 35% of the 4090, and the 4060 Ti again at 27%. Now, the RTX 4060, they're listing in gray here with a question mark because without clock speeds, uh, you can't actually do this calculation. I believe what they're doing here is saying if the 4060 clocked like the 4060 Ti uh, with its rumored specs, uh, with the even further cut down CUDA cores, that would put it at 19% of the performance of the 4090. Now again, the FP32 raw compute is not necessarily the exact gaming performance that you would see, but it does give us a way to roughly estimate um, the performance of this product lineup. Now, while NVIDIA did not announce the RTX 4070 at GDC, they did announce Workstation RTX 4000 small form factor ADA desktop GPU and five mobile SKUs of um, Workstation cards. Now, my channel focuses mostly on gaming GPUs, so I'm not going to go into too many details here. And again, all, all my... Uh, all my sources will be linked in the description, so you could look uh, look here. Um, I, I'm finding this at videocards.com, but also NVIDIA has their own page on it. And uh, let's just pop over into the next story. Huge GPU news. Uh, the Raja Kaduri, who had been Intel Arcs, uh, you know, the, the guy in charge at Intel over the Intel Arc division, although recently we'd seen him shifted to another position and the whole stru corporate structure around their GPU division changed. Um, so Raja Kaduri is leaving Intel. So he says, uh, so Pat Gelsinger, the CEO of Intel, was uh, thanking Raj on Twitter for his many contributions to Intel tech and architecture, especially with their high performance graphics uh, that helped bring three new product lines to market in 22. But he's been there for six years, I think, um, you know, getting all that development going. Anyway, so he, apparently where is he going? He's going to create a new software company around generative AI for gaming, media, and entertainment. 
Raja Kaduri saying, thank you, Pat and Intel, for many cherished memories. Now, some people are instantly jumping on, does this mean Intel is killing their, their ARC GPUs? We have not seen that. Um, although one of the main people denying it was Raja, and now Raja is leaving, but that does still does not actually mean that Intel is killing their ARC GPUs. Um, so at this point, I would say there's no reason to believe Intel is not moving forward with their plans, um, just without Raja at the helm. When Raja left AMD, it did not mean AMD stopped producing GPUs. They got someone else in charge, kept going, and I hate to say it, but it seems like their GPUs were more competitive with him gone, although I'm not saying they were more competitive because he was gone. Um, anyway, I should probably move on to some other stories. Uh, last night, Jay's Two Cents posted a video uh, titled Another Game Blowing Up NVIDIA GPUs. Here we go again. So I was curious what this was all about. Uh, so uh, watching the video and then looking into where this all came from, it's looking like there are reports of Diablo 4 killing uh, some NVIDIA GPUs, just bricking them. Now we have seen other games do this. I think this this was previously a big deal when New World came out, uh, that kind of a thing. Um, but to be clear, and, and to be fair, uh, Jay did say this in his video, it's not that the game is actually killing the GPU. Usually what it is, is there's some flaw in the GPU that is being revealed by the specific workload that is taking place during this game. Uh, so the, it does look like there are multiple reports of people playing D the Diablo 4 beta, where especially during certain cutscenes and things like that, he says, monitors turned off, had to restart my PC. Motherboard is now posting error code 97, nothing is working, GPU is dead, hope to get some clarity from Blizzard. Um, this at least appears to be, a, this one appears to be a Gigabyte RTX 3080 Ti Vision OC. Anyway, um, I'm just going to throw it out here that this is being reported, although from what I can see, it doesn't seem like a massive number of people, but just something to be aware of. And if you're curious what that video was all about, that appears to be the issue. And, you know, if you're uh, terrified of that happening to you, maybe stay away from that particular game right now. Um, although you could... Uh, Usually a frame rate limiter or something like that can help these these stress tests not destroy the GPU. Although, um, again, to be clear, if the GPU was working properly, that wouldn't happen in the first place. Um, so anyway, let's move on to other game news. How about Cyberpunk 2077's path tracing? So we've been hearing all about the RT Overdrive mode ever since uh, the RTX 40 series was officially announced. Um, it was a headline of all of these 40 series announcements, but we still don't have Cyberpunk's uh, path tracing mode, except now we at least have a date, April 11th. However, with that being said, this is phrased a little interestingly. So let's read what this says. This says, Game Developer CD Projekt Red today at Game Developer Conference in San Francisco unveiled a technology preview for Cyberpunk 2077 with path tracing coming April 11th. So I'm, I don't know, you could read this as saying that, there it, that they unveiled a preview and that preview will be coming on April 11th to people. I'm hoping I'm not reading into those details too much and that this really does mean the full like RT overdrive mode to the game is coming. Um, but they keep saying this tech preview is a sneak peek I'm hoping they just mean that what was shown at GDC was a preview and that what we're getting on April 11th isn't just a preview. Maybe I'm reading too much into the wording on that. Anyway, uh, I did watch a lot of what they revealed on this. And again, the idea behind path tracing is, is just ray tracing, but it's uh, significantly more advanced ray tracing. It's more complete ray tracing. All of the light is much more accurately simulated. Uh, around the scene. It's also incredibly demanding on the GPU. I really do think you will need the fake frames from DLSS 3 to get smooth performance. Um, but they were also showing off some of um, NVIDIA's other tools for how to implement this and um, take advantage of things like, of, like uh, shader execution reordering, which again is an RTX 40 series thing. So anyway, we'll see what comes of that. 
Uh, there was an, a really interesting video from Hardware Unboxed yesterday as well. Now, I'm not going to show you all of their slides. Again, all my sources are in the description. But basically, when they were working on, let me get out of the way so you can see uh, the title of the video. This is the Ryzen 9 7950X3D versus Core i9-13900K pre-fight <laughs> a Z790 issues. So basically, uh, Steve noticed some issues when he was testing his uh, his 13900K, uh, basically, where on different motherboards, it was performing different differently. He ended up realizing it came down to whether that certain boards, uh, specifically Gigabyte, were not enabling resizable bar by default the way they were supposed to, and then that led him to test with rebar on versus rebar off, and notice that in some games, not all games, but very certain games, like Horizon Zero Dawn, for example, um, performance was significantly worse with resizable bar enabled. He was testing on an RTX 4090. Now, so he was also interested then to see if that also took place on the 7950X3D AMD CPU, and notice that rebar performance was worse than with rebar off in that game, but not nearly as dramatically as it was on the 13900K platform. So that was an interesting difference. Now to be clear, this is not the case in every game. This is just the case in a couple of games that he noticed. Now, one thing that I'm curious about that I don't believe he tested in this video, I did watch the full video, is does this performance degrade only when your CPU limited, because I'm curious whether having rebar on helps GPU performance, but then hurts the, uh, hurts your performance when your CPU limited. Because to be clear, he's specifically doing CPU benchmarking here using an RTX 4090 at 1080p. Um, so anyway, I'm just curious what would be the case, and you should watch their full video for a lot more details on this. I actually also was curious if NVIDIA um, had, had noticed this at all. I was able to find in their studio drivers, maybe I missed it in their normal drivers, but I did find in their studio drivers a recent note that said they disabled Horizon Zero Dawn resizable bar profile on Intel platforms, on their studio drivers, which would indicate to me that they are actually aware of this issue and notice they did specifically say on Intel platforms because it does seem to be worse on this Intel platform. Now, also I've seen some comments of people saying, well, uh, why are um, hardware unboxed enabling resizable bar on games where it hurt per hurts performance? Doesn't, um, doesn't Nvidia only whitelist games where resizable bar uh, helps performance? And the answer to that is, well, Nvidia did whitelist Horizon Zero Dawn because it has helped performance um, on many GPUs. But this, I think, could just be complicated again, where maybe it helps performance on certain motherboards and uh, hurts it on others, and that would be a more complicated situation. This is also one of the reasons why I, while I understand where NVIDIA is coming from with their whitelist, uh, I do personally prefer on AMD's software with smart access memory, you just have a toggle. You can just toggle switch yourself, whether you want resizable bar enabled or not. Um, well, smart access memory, as they call it. Um, and you can do it in software, uh, whereas in uh, NVIDIA, you have to download like a third-party NVIDIA profile inspector if you want to turn it on or off manually, which is a little bit annoying. I wish they just put it in their driver software uh, because, yeah, anyway. Let's go ahead and talk, if I'm mentioning drivers, uh, AMD did get out a new driver, 23.3.2. And this one's uh, the main features are support for RE4 Remake, as well as The Last of Us Part 1, and um, additional Vulkan extensions, also a list of some uh, fixed issues, still some known issues out there. And moving on, speaking of AMD GPUs, in a lot of my reviews, people ask, but what about virtual reality performance? And my honest answer to that question is, I don't have a virtual reality focused channel. I don't cur currently have a virtual reality headset. Um, I did have one briefly. It's just not something I'm super, well, super, I am interested in VR. Let me put it this way. I am very interested in VR. It's not something I have time for right now. And also, YouTube, the YouTube algorithm honestly kind of rewards doubling down on a small niche. 
And VR is kind of its own niche, which not everyone who's interested in overall PC gaming is interested in VR. Long story short, I was looking to see if there was any channels actually specifically testing VR performance. Um, and I did find a, re a recent review of the 7900 XTX published, uh, I think just a day or two ago now at americsot 78 And so um, some people, I had heard in my comment section, people saying that the AMD GPUs are much worse for VR. Now watch this full video for his full thoughts. And again, links will be in the description. And he does uh, review a lot of other GPUs in VR as well. I haven't had a t chance to watch them all. But he does mention a few games with some weird image artifacting related to the anti-aliasing. Uh, also mentioned that if you're specifically using the Oculus Quest 2, um, either plugged in or using its Air Link, those use compressed video feeds. And if you use the Air Link, it uses the H.264 encoder, which is well known to be not quite as good on AMD as it is on Nvidia. It still looks okay, but it's not quite as good. Although he does mention in the video, and that's the screenshot that I have here, that AMD's HEVC encoder is very good. It looks just as good as anything you're seeing on, from the Intel, uh, sorry, from the Nvidia GPU. Um, but that's not supported on the Oculus Quest's uh, Air Link app, um, that you would use a, a program like Virtual Desktop, something like that, to stream through it. Anyway, it's all very interesting, although he did mention a bit of stuttery performance in a couple of games, including Half-Life Alex. Also, again, the streaming quality on is only relevant if you are streaming to something like an Oculus Quest, if you're using a headset that actually just plugs in directly via HDMI, uh, or display port, then that would not be an issue at all. So anyway, just throwing that out there because people do ask me about this. Now, another thing people like to ask me about is OLED because I'm well known to love OLED. I'm on an OLED, uh, I'm on the a Dell QD OLED Alienware right now filming this video. Um, and then right next to me right there is my LG C1 OLED. I've got an OLED screen on my phone. You know, I like OLED a lot. <laughs> However, the big issue on OLED is burn-in, and I've been waiting for ratings. You do say ratings, right? Not artings. I'm a, right, right? Okay, anyway. Um, to do some of their updated testing for OLED image retention on um, the newer OLED panels, both QD OLED and the newer LG uh, WOLEDs. And very interestingly, because QD OLED was touted as probably being better at avoiding image retention, that is not what their testing is showing. Um, their, their LG uh, C2 OLED is showing no image retention after their two month stress test. Now let's be clear here, this is not two months of a typical use case, this is two months of an absolutely horrific stress test for OLED screens to try to accelerate image retention so they can get you information about what it could be like over a long period of time, but get you that information quicker. Uh, this might be hard to see in my video. I'll, again, sources in the description. Uh, do you guys see right here? This is image retention right there, okay? That's image retention. There's That's not showing up on the LG C2 OLED. And they're showing that even their old uh, LG OLEDs, like the C7, um, it took, even after uh, 16 weeks, um, which is a longer period of time here, right? Um, they were still seeing less burn-in, although some burn-in, than what they're seeing quickly on the QD OLED Samsungs. So that is very interesting. However, it doesn't just seem to be QD OLED versus uh, WOLED. It's something about how LG does this because um, they also compared it to Sony's um, WOLEDs, right? So uh, the Sony ones actually were showing worse image retention than LG, even though Sony's using LG panels on their displays. So something about how LG is doing this is better for image retention than what, we're, for example, here you see the, so the LG C1 versus the Sony A90K, um, in this screen, you can really see the image retention issue very clearly. Anyway, I think this is very interesting. And, and they tried to figure out why the LG in particular was doing better, not just its panel, but even it's just actual TVs versus the same panel in another TV. Uh, they couldn't narrow it down. 
Now, uh, when it came to, by the way, if you're confused on this whole WoLED versus QD OLED and all that, the uh, the LG panels have a white um, subpixel to help boost brightness, whereas the um, the uh, QD OLEDs don't need that. They just use RGB and then run it through a, a quantum dot layer. Anyway, but the point is that they're very different. Now, they're speculating in this article that the um, because to produce white light on the uh, QD OLEDs, you have to run the red, green, and blue at the same time. If maybe that is leading to more uh, burn-in than, um, than when you can just run the white subpixel uh, to get the white light on these. Again, that's speculation. So they try to narrow down. This is a huge article. I highly recommend taking a look at it, but we should move on for the purposes of today's news video. Uh, in other monitor news, Alienware is launching its previously announced uh, AW2524H IPS. I'm not quite sure what the 25 indicates here. I think it's a 24 inch IPS gaming monitor. Um, it's 500 hertz refresh rate for $829. It's also 1080p. So this is very clearly targeted at esports gaming. You want high refresh rates, 1080p, um, 24 inch size. All of that, 829, it's certainly not cheap, but it is 500 hertz. Um, now in other news, we're seeing Asus dropping a hint that we will be seeing Ryzen 7000 Threadrippers coming in uh, in the second half of 2023. Um, apparently this uh, was during some kind of video where they were discussing some uh, other stuff and it, it was just kind of, mentioned there. I'm seeing this as a videocards.com article. Again, sources will be in the description. So if you're interested in uh, Ryzen 7000 Threadripper, it could be coming soon-ish. Now, uh, in other motherboard type pl uh, support news, Gigabyte is teasing support for 48 gigabyte models of uh, memory. Um, again, this non-binary DDR5 6000 memory um, support has also been uh, available in like a beta update from ASUS I reported in my last video, and you can already get support for this on some Intel platforms. So it's AMD platforms that seem to be, you know, very close to getting this officially supported as well. Now, um, Pallet is launching another uh, model of its 4080s and 4070 Ti coolers. This is the Jetstream. They've done a Jetstream in the past, although it had been a while. Um, and then here we go. Here's the Jetstream. One thing to note is it looks black with no RGB, so that could fit some people's builds. Although for now, it looks like it's not, um, it's not like a factory overclocked model or anything like that, so it might not be like a real premium card. Uh, but if you're looking for the black um, with no RGB, that could be a good way to go. Uh, in other news, we're seeing that Halo Infinite, while it always listed four gigabytes as a uh, system requirement for the game, you could actually launch the game with less than four gigabytes until now. It's looking like with the latest Halo Infinite update, uh, people with less than four gigabytes of VRAM just cannot launch the game at all. It says, could not find a compatible graphics device with at least four gigabytes of available video memory, and it just doesn't launch. So if you were squeaking by with three gigabytes of VRAM um, and just dealing with the performance hit that came with that, now you just can't even make that choice. Not allowed. Anyway, uh, in other gaming news though, in technology news, Counter-Strike 2 has been announced. Um, it looks like it's gonna be basically porting CSGO over to the Source 2 engine, but it is like a complete rebuild of the game, it seems like, uh, from the announcement, including interesting technologies like sub-tick responsiveness. Um, and uh, the smoke grenades seem like the other big change where they're actually volumetric and, and have physical properties. Uh, could change gameplay, clear them with a nade. Anyway, this, uh, I, since this is a technology-focused video, this sub-tick thing seems interesting. So normally, you know, if, if, if your uh, action happened in between server ticks, um, now I guess it's gonna keep track of how, you know, where it happened in between each server tick. So if your shot was fired at a certain time when somebody ran past, you know, anyway, it could be an interesting netcode uh, technology. We'll see what ha happens with that though. Last thing I'll leave you guys with with new gaming tech is 
uh, showing off Unreal Engine 5.2, which is adding in, um, what is it called, substrate uh, technologies and um, uh, for really cool detailed textures and things, as well as procedural content generation, uh, which seems like it could greatly speed up game development. Um, they did show off, for example, uh, let's say you have this this uh, element here and you wanted to move it. Well, they show that you can just pick it up and move it. I think they're going to show, is this not going to play? There we go. They just move it, and then the the content will procedurally generate around it to fill in the gaps with you know all, all the appropriate things. And then this whole area in the background is also procedurally generated based on an artist created uh, small, I think they said they had like a 200 meter uh, area that was created by an artist, and then it was able to procedurally generate off of that to fill in uh, several kilometers of space, uh, which seems like a really cool tech and Unreal Engine 5. Again, looking impressive. Be excited to get more games there besides Fortnite. Anyway, <laughs> I hope all of you have an excellent day.